hello, all of you, and thank you for taking time out of your busy uh, schedule to be here this morning. It's a great opportunity, opportunity to be here this morning, and it's really an honor to be able to speak to all of you. So I thank all of you in the virtual land for joining us uh, here this morning. I had the opportunity to come out about a month ago and observe a lecture that was uh, being conducted on uh, rapid eye movement. I uh, was so impressed with the professionalism in which the lecture was conducted. And so, again, I feel honored to be here uh, speaking to all of you that are present and those of you online. So, just a couple of questions then. Uh, for those of you that are out there in the virtual land, some of you are responding to this, if you have an idea of how many of you have served with the military, has anybody uh, in here, other than myself, served with the uh, military? Great. All right. So, how many of you are counselors or provide counseling services? Great. Awesome. And then, how many of you are professors in the faculty uh, here? Great. So, a lot of dual hats going on. So, thanks for all your work. One of the things I do want to do is say thank you to all of you who serve us in different aspects of our lives, both in the environment. Many times, those individuals that you provide these services to do not have the opportunity to come back and say thank you. And we thank you and we provide them with tools and skills that they need to go on and become productive members in our communities and to find ownership in their lives and in their voice for themselves. And again, by the time they get by to you, they're moved on, they're living their lives, they're, they're out there enjoying life again, and they don't have a chance to go back and say thank you. So on behalf of our families, let me say thank you. I look forward to all of your questions. Many times when you're talking about the prevention of sexual violence or domestic violence, uh, people feel intimidated or they they embarrassed to ask us a question. There is not a question that you can ask that you can't ask. So please, any question that you have, feel free to ask. Okay, so who am I? Again, I served 22 years in the military of the United States Army. I was an military police officer. Um, and it was halfway through my career that I was raised by my battalion commander. He was my immediate supervisor. I had worked for him for over a year. And uh, the devastating effect that it had on my life was that it was way too long to prevent in the short amount of time that I had. So I won't go into all of that. But let me say that I do understand the challenges of dealing with uh, sexual assault from a personal perspective. The issues related to reporting. Um, kind of the reluctance that individuals have in going to counseling. So I understand what those challenges are. Um, while I was on active duty, I did provide assistance to other uh, soldiers that were on active duty and helped them navigate those challenges. Um, I have a doctorate in education. Uh, as, I, as I started to deal with the issues in the military, I was compelled to want to make a difference. And what I found was that as an individual, I couldn't get through the door as easily as the doctor did. So um, getting my doctorate became uh, a priority. And so I, I sent him to the University of Southern California, who had a cohort program in Hawaii. And while on active duty, he completed my coursework. I retired in 2003 and posted my doctorate in 2005. I was lucky in 2007 with visiting USC and was subsequently hired by them. And I work in the Boston School of Education in the Boston Support Center. I currently assist Boston students in completing uh, their graduation requirements. Ninety percent of them, I hope them with their GPA success. I can't go back and help you with those discussions on completing your dissertation. When I first started at USC, I worked with a grant on promoting uh, and understanding and promoting. Uh, the prevention of violence of uh, sexual assault on college campuses, and we still have that grant at USC. I also serve on the board of directors of the East Valley Women's Center, and I really enjoy my work there. It's a small organization. Uh, they do a lot of great work there, and, uh, and I know that many of you here also serve in those capacities. So I thank you for the work that you continue to do in our city. Okay, so modeling the way. You know, a lot of times when we think about making a difference, we think we have to be the Martin Luther King of the world and to, to really make a difference. And we don't have to be. All we have to do is want to make a difference in the world around us, for the people that we touch and engage activities. And so you are the leaders of Jews, all of you out there in virtual land. An impact and make a difference in your community. And all you have to do is want to make a difference. 
So you have to set the example, you have to show up in the country of God, and, um, and understand that what you do is what people are going to see. And so, again, you don't have to be a soldier. I was doing a speaking event in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, in Los Angeles, and we were there. And uh, there were two young girls on our team, and they're going to school 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 school. They're 14, 15 year olds, and they're out walking school supplies for kids who can't afford it to buy school supplies for themselves. They're 14 and 15 years old, and they started this whole school supply drive on their own. Both of them just buy and then distribute them to the kids in the middle of the kids in school. So you can see, all you have to do is be one of the kids. You come up with a plan, and then you have to come up. So, be a leader, decide what you want to do. There are three phases that I think you need to consider when you look at promoting the protection of violence against women or breaking the cycle of violence. First is after the assault. Is what's happening during the assault now. Could be over an extended period of time, could be over a short period of time, who cares? And then there's what happens uh, before the assault. So let me pose a question to you. Where do you think we spend most of our time right now? Right now, where do we think we spend the bulk of our time and our resources? After the assault. And so, now I'm not diminishing the work that happens there, but really, we need to focus more of our thinking on before the assault. And so, when you think about that, there are three perspectives or underlying themes that I think you'll find that go throughout the presentation. One is how do we promote prevention? And that'll come out in the presentation. Secondly, how does the victim see the world? And how does that affect some of the choices that they make during these processes? And how do you facilitate the choice? So those are three underlying themes. I'm going to focus on how do you promote prevention, which is what we want to do before these crimes occur. So let's try to understand a little bit about the problem. And as you can see, it's devastating. One out of every six women, or one out of five, depending on which study that you look at, one out of every 33 men will be sexually assaulted. And these are not stranger rates. It's not somebody ducking out from behind the hedges, right, in a dark parking lot, or in a park, or in a secluded area. These are by people whose women know. The gender of the ages. 99.6% of women are raped by men. 85% of male victims are raped by men, by men, the perpetrators of these crimes are men. So if we look at the percentages in the military, because I do have an interest in what still happens in the military, those numbers are not much different. It's still 99% of the crimes are being committed by men. One of the things I want you to consider is where is the social outrage that goes with this problem? Okay, so we said one out of five women are in, in our social communities are being assaulted. One out of 33 men. Most of them know, who's, know the perpetrator. And yet, where's the social outrage? Well, if one out of five homes on your block goes down, what would happen? There'd probably be a riot. What if one out of five cars in your neighborhood was stolen? What would be the outcry that would come from that? It would be sadness. People would be up and on. Yet when we think about sexual assault, when we have to deal with sexual assault, we don't get that same kind of outrage. And what do you think contributes to that? Underground. Exactly. One, it's not something that we feel comfortable with. It's a very personal thing. Victims don't want to come forward for a number of reasons. They feel that they're shot. They feel betrayed. They don't know who to trust. If they know the person who assaulted them, then they don't know who to trust, which is probably somebody that, that they trust. There's also social debation that takes place out there. How victims are viewed in the media and things like that have a lot to do with how victims are going to react and how individuals who have to look into these cases are going to react. So, 
they are difficult weeks. So when we look at the outcomes, one, only about 60 to about 85 percent of these times are going to get reported. So there's a huge reduction. Again, one, victims are, are traumatized. So they're experiencing shock. They don't know who to trust. They don't understand a lot about what's happening, and yet we expect them to make good decisions, right, about reporting. So it becomes very important that as friends, when somebody reports a crime to somebody that they know, that that friend step up and make good choices for them. Help them make good choices because they are not going to make good choices for themselves. When a house burns down, people will rally around the family whose house is burnt down and provide all kinds of support, advice, get them to the services they need. But when it comes to sexual assault, it becomes more difficult. And let me tell you why. If the victim knows the perpetrator, who else is going to know the perpetrator? Family and friends. And so now, it's a difficult one. Who are you going to blame? The victim or the other person that you know? Because you're probably going to know both of these people. When a case does get reported, very few are prosecuted. And the reason is, is because it depends on who said, she, she said, situation. Victims don't go and get the, the, the types of uh, reports that they need in the hospital, they can assume the court of the prosecution. Then they go home and take a shower. And so now they've wiped away all the evidence. I think it's five out of the shower. After my assault. You can't get enough hot water. Get everything off of them. So they become very, very difficult cases to prosecute. So if we look at an army situation, they started with a thousand subjects. Only 280 they took action on, and 56 went to court martial. And of the 56, only a small percentage of those were actually uh, adjudicated. Okay, so we know a little bit about the outcomes, and outcomes are much better than reporting. So one of the things we want to look at is just look at the history of training. How have we handled these in the past? Okay, so some of us may be able to go way back, while others may not be able to go as far back. But let's talk about what did it first look like. So let's go back 20, 25 years. What did prevention programs or initiatives look like then? Yeah, we want to teach you some kung fu. Now we try to take somebody out, some big guy, right? We're going to try and take him out. Okay. What are some of the other things that they did? Exactly. Whistles, right? Now, this is the funniest one, right? And they were handing out whistles. We actually went to a box and found old whistles from a long time ago that they could hand out, right? So, like, you're going to be assaulted. You're going to say, hold on. Let me get my whistle. I have it in my sock. And you're going to reach down there, pull that whistle out. <laughs> Somebody, help me, please, right? The other thing they put out now, you see them on campus, is the little blue boxes with the blue light, right? And those are great if somebody's jumping out from the top of the head, right? But what we know now is what, what percentage know the perpetrators? 80%? Right? So it's not the stranger way. So we have to come up with a different approach. So one of the next approaches that we used was this kind of mixed bag thing when we brought men and women in together in the prison and we talked about the problem with them. The problem was is how did people feel when they left that thing? Pretty bad. Guys felt like they'd been beat about the head and shoulders with a bat. You know, like, I'm a bad guy, right? What did I do wrong? Because we were focusing on perpetrators and talking to groups as if they were all perpetrators. So men felt bad when they left the situation. They didn't feel compelled to make a difference. Now we're doing what we call peer training or bystander training, where men take charge and inform them more about. Uh, what's going on. One of the things that we see that's different is how situations are being viewed. You see more of a community approach. The reason we can change how we do training is because we know more about the perpetrators. One, 
we know that they don't represent this large male population that is out there. In fact, the perpetrators represent about 6.7 to 7.6 of the male population. So you have a small percentage of guys that are responsible for a lot of crimes. Lisa and Miller did a nice study of unprotected rapists, and they did it on a college campus. What they did as a precursor is they went out and they interviewed male rapists in our penitentiary, the penitentiary here in our jails. And they found that there were certain ways that these men felt about women, how aggressive they were, how they thought about their masculinity, and they just asked them a number of questions. They went out and they asked college men the same questions, and what they found out is that that small percentage of men weren't even those questions that they wanted. Right. And so you don't find that they're in any particular group, but that the 7.6% is spread out amongst all groups. You're not going to find them in fraternities, you're not going to find them just in sports departments, you're going to find them in the architecture department, you're going to find them in the engineering, you're going to find them in the medical field, you're going to find them everywhere. They have high levels of anger towards women. They're very hyper masculine, they'll publicly talk bad about their mothers, their sisters, their girlfriends, they're not worthy, they're stupid, they can't do anything right. Have any of you ever seen anything like that? You see it all the time. They do? <laughs> they exceed the norms when it comes to accounts of related to sex. And, and so I have done some speaking events at some high school where I had, you know, young men in the audience and they would crack up and I said, yeah, guys. All of you are not scoring. I'm just letting you know that's the norm. It's the bad guys that go out and talk about scoring six and seven times, and that's much higher than they're, they're scoring once a year, they're scoring six or seven times a month or something like that. They're very high. They're very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They advertise it. You know, they're very proud of this. But it's not a good thing. And so the other guys are out there thinking there's something wrong with them. Well, no, you guys are the ones that are okay. High rates of repeat rape. The interesting part was the guys that were in, uh, incarcerated for rape had committed multiple assaults. And so let's say they said, okay, well, I was convicted of committing seven assaults. What didn't get reported was the other nine that they had committed that didn't get caught uh, or weren't prosecuted for. So even though they reported that, you know, the, the, the penal system is capturing that they've committed six or seven assaults, there were also the assaults that they weren't prosecuted for that they committed. And again, so you see that there's this very small percentage of men that are responsible for a large percentage of crimes. So this 6.4% of men that met the criteria for rape, these are college boys. These are college men. Young men in college that when they describe the things that they do for, that, that they were doing to the young women on the college campuses, that's the criteria for rape. 63% reported multiple rapes. 80% used drugs or alcohol. So in other words, they might be using those date rape pills and things like that. And so uh, many of you, I'm sure, have heard of situations where women wake up the next day and they don't know how they got to where they are. They can't even recall everything that happened. They just know that they went on right about what happened to them that night. And that's the use of um, date rape drugs. And a, a small percentage, and 10% will use uh, violence, uh, threats, or for, um, overt force. Okay. So now we know a lot more about the perpetrators. It helps us understand on how we can change our thing and focus it more clearly. So, why do you think they get away with it? Well, we talked a little bit about how it's a difficult topic to even broach in public, right? It's not an area that people are comfortable with. And it's usually because if they don't have the information to make informed decisions about the situation. But they get away with it because they're supposed to get them. Who are they picking? And let me tell you, they're not going out and Picking somebody just randomly, and it's not an area that they're comfortable with. They will look for the social network in their area, and they will blend in their 
very smart, they're handsome, they're charming, and they blend in. They just look like the other guys in the place. Again, they don't use a lot of violence, but they use just enough where they can get uh, control of the situation. In other words, they'll isolate the woman and they'll use an arm bar to the throat. So they don't necessarily need a lot of bruising, cutting, or anything like that, but they use just enough force where they can keep hold of women and not leave them up. And so because there's no injury, it becomes more difficult to prosecute. There are counties. These perpetrators that are out there in our social networks are counting on you to buy into the social network after to address provocation. Uh, he was drinking. We were all drinking. We didn't know what we were doing. It was a confusing situation. They are, they will bet money that you're going to side with them because they're smart, they're faster, they're clean cut, and they're very, very kind. One of the ways that I describe them is like the serial killer. And that's what they're the serial labor and they operate in the flex and they put it. So when you think about a uh, documentary that maybe you've seen on Bundy, uh, how do you describe it? Got it. Nice guy. Help me with my lawn. Help me wash my car. Help me spray my groceries in. Charming. Easy going. Blend it in. One of the things when we talk about the social myths is the use of alcohol becomes very difficult. For some reason, people think that if alcohol is involved, it dismisses the crime. When we have somebody who runs over somebody else who's been drinking, we go to the victim and say, why aren't you looking at the car from the other We don't do that. But when it comes to sexual assault, we put a lot of responsibility on the victim when alcohol is involved. So it's a two-edged sword that we have to be careful with how we discuss alcohol in the case of that we do that. Okay, so how do they operate? They're intelligent, they're smart, they're navigating your social net. So, okay, so what might that look like? It might look like a situation where, I think of a local home that people like to go to. Name one. Two one. Just on the street down the road on the Cape Cod. Great dancing place, right? Go in there, you can order food, you can have some drinks. Great place to get together, right? It could be a pizza parlor, hamburger place, but, you know, a place where there's music, there's drinks, people hang out, happy hour, after work, places like that. Okay, so you have a group. Let's say there's three guys and three girls that go into this place. They're just hanging out, you know, and then new talker comes over, right? You've seen him before, he's been in the bar before, but he comes over and joins the table. He doesn't ask to join the table. He just joins the table. Okay? He becomes part of the group, right? And then buys everybody around. Nice guy. I like him already, right? Okay. Then starts buying the women more drinks. Not buying the guys drinks so much, but really likes to buy the ladies drinks. Now, he's drinking as well, but what you don't know is that when he goes to the bar, he's coming back with the same drink. Maybe he's watered it down. It appears that he's drinking, but not drinking as much. It appears to be impaired, but he is not impaired. And then what they're going to do is they're going to work the guys at the table. Let's say Jim's at the table. And this guy's name is Scott. So Scott looks over to Jim and says, Jim, you want to be with He's going to have an impression. I'd really love to get him over there. Is there any chance you could have her meet me over at the bar? I'd like to talk to her in a more quiet setting, right? What do you think Jim's going to do? Yeah. I'll send her right over. You know, so Scott goes up to the bar. Maria goes up and sits at the bar with him. Maybe he's already bought the drink of her choice and has slipped something in the drink before she gets there. But he's isolated her from the group, right? I'm just a nice guy. He's kind of a little bit better, too. He'd really be helping him out. And the guys, they don't want to talk about that, right? They don't. They're like, yeah, let me introduce you. Or let's say it's on a college campus. You're on a college campus. He might say something like, 
I really like the dish around Maria. The bomb's not too far. She's had a little bit of drink. I have to walk the back and make sure she gets home safely. Wow, you're a nice lady. You can really do me a favor if you do that. Yes, there's one more. Get the girl intoxicated, slip something into the drink, isolate her from the drink. Now, if there's a question about it the next day, what do you think he's going to say? Right. We were both drinking. Right. I didn't know what I was doing. That's how it happened. In the last couple of years, we've seen a number of things. One of them that I can do is one that um, that we're looking for men to kind of step up and, and take a lead in, in what needs to be done. Have, have any of you heard of, uh, I think it's Sassy Cat? He does a lot of work on male masculinity and talks about how men can take the lead in helping other men understand masculinity and how that defines for them. And uh, we know that the perpetrators for the crime are men. But where has the responsibility generally rested in addressing this? On women. Right? Now, if you're in a group, right, and you have some men out there, and you haven't been talked to them about sexual assault, who do you think they're going to probably talk to you? Women? Men. If there's men in the group, right, and you're talking to men, you have men in the group, right, and you have to have a presenter to talk about sexual assault, what it means, and to be talk, talk to them pointedly, who do you think they're going to respond better to? A woman or a man? A man, right. So we need men in training position, out there doing the training, bystander training, right? Another thing that I've heard uh, recently in a lot of the lectures that I've attended is that it's not viewed as a woman's problem, they need to deal with it, figure out what we're going to do for support, but it's more of a community responsibility. That everybody in the community has a responsibility on what we're going to do to address the problem. And I really like that. Because it doesn't put it on anybody's shoulders. But how can we get more men involved? That's a major uh, challenge. So, high standard training. Berkowitz has done a lot of work in uh, social campaigns. And what he's suggesting is, is that if you were to go on to a college campus, you would survey the men in that community. Find out what are their uh, views about sexual activity, how do you see women, maybe drinking, use of uh, tobacco, things like that. And what you would do is you would present a poster that says 90% 90, 90 of our men say you should treat women with respect. So what you're doing is you're actually posting information relevant to that community job and you're validating what's good in the things that they believe and the things that they value. So that 10% that think it's okay to talk bad about women, they know that that's not the norm. That really what they're thinking is the norm. And so what Berkowitz says is that while we know that a minority of men are responsible for the violence that takes place, that all men can influence what other men do to other men are alive. And so that's what we want to uh, tap into. So, bystander training. What does that include? Well, there's a, Levine did a study in 2002 looking at um, in-group and out-group uh, research, okay? So if you think about things that happen on campuses, let's say a high school campus, we know that if there's going to be a fight, everybody's going to be there, right, to see what's going to happen, okay? Now, if the person that's being picked on is popular, we know that people are going to like to their age. That's how they use it. If the person that's being picked on is not so popular, then people aren't going to get involved so, so readily because they don't have a vested interest. That person is what they call an outgroup. What we do know, though, is that the people that are in the community, if they know that what's happening is wrong, they do want to step up and make a difference, but they don't want to be the only one. What they don't know is that if they will just step up and say what you're doing is wrong, that there's four or five other people that will also step forward and say 
to be doing this law. But they're really not going to be alone with it. So the understanding of the, of the dynamics about how in-group and out-group uh, situations occur become very important. So part of bystander training is, is to validate to individuals that when you step forward and say, you know, in our lives, we don't talk about it anymore. But there's others that will step forward and say, yeah, you, you, why did you say that about your sister? We don't talk about our like that. So we have to train them on approaches, how to respond to situations, because they're not equipped with those skills. We don't get up in the morning and think, how would I respond to that? So we have to provide training on how to respond to different types of situations. And then there's a process that you have to go through. So that's the process that Lachlan and Ann Darley um, did to me through Tommy in the 70s. And that's one is that first you have to notice that there's a situation occurring that you need to intervene uh, with. Next, you have to interpret that really this kind of, this kind of like someone's at risk, that there's an emergency. You have to feel compelled to act. Because we see a lot of things and we don't necessarily feel compelled to act. And Steve and I were talking about this uh, last night about how some people can drive by a situation and not feel like, like they have to act, and others will stop their car and get out and provide some assistance. And then you need the resources or the skills to react to the situation. So you can see that even if you want to do something, then there's this whole process that you have to kind of go through to actually act. So training becomes very important. So we don't need to beat up what the problem is. And we don't need to beat guys up about we need you to do more. What we need to do is equip them with the skills so that when situations do arise in their daily activities, they're prepared to respond to them in a way that will diffuse it. And at the same time, let the people know that we're saying things that are a little odd, but they're not really welcome. You know, that why would you say that? We don't talk about the women in our lives that way. But we very seldom train our young men to step up and say that. They might just laugh and go, oh, that was funny. Yeah, that was funny. No, it's not fun. And to be able to say why it's not fun. That's what we need to do. Final thoughts. Research currently suggests overwhelmingly that those best able to stop those from home, that if we can get them out talking about the matter, it will make a difference. But if they challenge men on the choices that they're making, it will make a difference. What we don't want to happen is that we have this small percentage of men, that 6.7 to 7.6 percent, defining masculinity to the other hundred percent that have it. But that's what happens. So we can break the cycle of violence against women by using some of these new initiatives, bystander training, a, a social norms approach, and providing information to our young people. And the last thing I want to mention is to remember that the victims of these crimes have a voice. And to always be sensitive to their voice and be genetic. To validate what skills they have that they've used in the past to help them be successful. And to tap into those as you work with them in their recovery. To be present with them. So you can make a difference. And I'll leave you with this quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson. What you do thunders above your head so loudly, I cannot hear the words you say. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Fisher. Okay, I have a number of uh, questions that are coming in from our virtual, virtual audience. I'll we'll take those and then I'll turn to the uh, in person audience here uh, after that. And I should uh, mention to the virtual audience that the Dr. Fisher has graciously agreed to sign a couple of your book. So if you're interested in that, please uh, submit a question or uh, um, or exist uh, or, or, or via chat. Just let us know that you're interested and we'll take care of that. Okay, a uh, number of questions from uh, uh, from those who work with the military. Okay. What do you see as, uh, it's kind of a two-part question from two different individuals. What do you see as roadblocks within the Department of Defense that need to be overcome so that the culture changes within the military to become more sensitive to victims of sexual abuse? Okay, so what can the military do to change the culture regarding sexual assault and abuse? Well, first of all, the military has started a number of initiatives to already work in that direction. 
Uh, one, they have a, um, a reporting system now where they don't have to disclose who they are when they report a crime. It doesn't have to be like who they're changing on. So that was a key change that the military um, has started. It doesn't necessarily mean that the perpetrator is going to be brought to justice, but they have a way of reporting the crimes taking place where they're not in the line on. So I think that's one thing that the military has done. The second thing that they've done, I think, that's historical is if you go to their websites now, they have a lot of information about uh, preventing sexual violence and things like that on their websites. I think what's missing, though, is that we don't train the leadership on understanding how the perpetrators operate and how to identify them and give them more clearly. So an example would be, let's say, the commander's driver. So one of the key roles in the military to be a company commander. So you may have 200 soldiers in your company. So you have a driver. The driver is generally somebody who's very high speed, low drag in your company. They really walk on water and they talk to God on a regular basis. Great young man. Charming, handsome, smart, right? Who do you think the perpetrators of the kind in that unit might be? That driver. Why? Close to the commander, the commander isn't going to want to believe that he could do anything wrong, right? Fits the profile, the characteristics, hyper masculine, uh, says things about women maybe that's inappropriate, right? But the commander doesn't know what he's looking for. Now, a woman in the unit is assaulted, maybe one of the clerks reports it to the first sergeant, right? The first sergeant takes it to the commander. And it says, he said, she said, we were at the club, we were both drinking, we took me back to my barracks, right? So the commander now has a responsibility to report it. But you always have that chance that that soldier is not going to report it because they have to report to somebody that they both know. So I think it becomes a leadership challenge. And I would suggest that if the military truly wants to make a difference, that they will train the leadership on understanding more about the perpetrators and how they operate. And then focusing their training on body changing training so that soldiers that are out there can really keep their own work well. Great. This is not her. She thinks it's a culture and agrees with your prevention approach, but she finds that victims do not have a voice in and on the street or not. It's a rather long, but uh, very, very important. My daughter was sexually abused in Europe when she was a child. Medical and psychological reports supported her allocations. The prosecutor in charge wrote to me, urging me to do everything in my power to protect her because she's a great danger. She still has that document. And she was aware that we were facing a billion room, fought on my daughter's behalf, as well as on behalf of other children. Children who were in the same situation, but was to no avail. And it was between being loyal to my daughter, to the system, I chose my daughter, but it came to the happy price for both of us. She is full of contempt for society and the justice system. She is convinced that all judges are corrupt. She's in poor health due to the stress she went through. I can prevent her, to protect her from further abuse, but she lives with the scars. My own life was turned upside down. I'll spare you with the rest of the details. I had a client in a similar situation. I don't know what I would advise that client to do a file a complaint. Maybe have him or her confronted to years of misery or just do nothing. No answer satisfies me. What is your take on this and what can we do to change the judicial system? Well, the difficulties in the judicial system are certainly still there. One, there's the reaction of law enforcement when it gets to the situation. Anytime they have a history of what's called the both parents of the You really want to put yourself through the other thing. They'll talk to victims out of the problem. First of all, I'm sorry for how the system responded uh, to you and your daughter. There's really no excuse for it. And, it, and it's saddening because it's going to affect both of your lives for a very long time. The good news is, is that you realize that the system failed you. And hopefully from that, you can focus on how can you put yourself and your daughter with the skills that she's going to need to deal with this new person. That you know, because when you are raped, when you are sexually assaulted, that person that you were before does not exist anymore. It's like, it's like a vacuum. It's like your spirit, the essence of who you are, has been sucked out of you. And so now you have to kind of try to rebuild yourself. 
And I personally would get annoyed with some people saying, well, get on with your life. And I just wanted to like, really? If I had a life to get on with, I would. You know, but you don't know. You don't understand what post-traumatic stress disorder is. You don't know why you're reacting to certain things. And I thought I was going crazy. So I can understand uh, the dilemmas that your daughter has, has felt in the system. I would challenge everybody to report. Report, report, report. There's going to be consequences on you emotionally and personally, whether you report or you don't report. But if you report, there's a chance you can catch them and look at something. Because we know that they are repeat defendants. We know that they're going to do it again. And so if you report, the chances of catching them are much stronger. So I encourage everybody to have a victim report. You're going to deal with the PTSD. You're going to deal with the emotional trauma, whether you do or you don't. I'll see you soon. Uh, since the studies indicate that many of the perpetrators uh, of sexual violence against women are known by, uh, by the victim, that suggests to the questioner that uh, the woman might have a blind trust in the person. What kind of training or knowledge does that woman at risk of being able to prevent these sorts of things? See, that's a difficult question because I think in a lot of regards we're trying to put the responsibility of preventing on the victims, right? And really, they're, again, they're much like serial killers. I don't think there's anything you can do to prevent. I think once they decide they want somebody, they're going to get that person. You know, I really do. I think once they've decided that they have a target, that they're going to do everything that they can to get that target. I would suggest that what we could do to probably help our young women is to train them more on understanding how the perpetrators operate. You know, that they want to isolate them from the group, uh, separate them from the people that they're socializing with, and to uh, monitor their groups. And when, you know, when they're in a bar or something like that, never uh, take a drink from somebody that's been carried over to you, make sure that it comes from the waitress. Or that you go to the bar and you get it yourself. You know, just things like that. Don't be predictable. And again, I, I, I hesitate in saying that because I think we're putting, again, responsibility on, on the victims. And, and, and I don't want to do that. I want to suggest that be careful, but still enjoy life, but understand what the red flags are. The fact that they know them, is there a blind trust? I don't think that it's a blind trust. I just think that you don't expect it. You're not expecting it because it is somebody that you trust. So I don't think it's a blind trust. I just think you don't think that somebody knows you did something wrong with you. So it's not about the number of uh, the number of male victims that you've heard of. Do these do the perpetrators of those crimes? Do they and do the crimes themselves? Do they share many of the characteristics of the uh, male to female sexual assault? You mentioned, or are they, or are they very different? I would be speculating and trying to answer that question, but my guess would be they would be the same. I don't think they would be much different. I don't think whatever motivates the man to rape a woman is going to be the same that motivates the man to rape a man. That it's power. Power difference. We've got many more questions coming in. Give the audience here a chance to jump in. Or... Yeah. Yes, this one's. Let me get the microphone over here. Okay. Um, my question, my question regards to the, is it the Lizek, uh, Miller study? Right. Um, in that study, they, they did an interview and created a, a question um, or pre predictive profile in the prison system that they then transferred to college setting where they were able to identify people with certain traits. Um, based on that type of research, is it possible to take that further? And create a true pre predictive profile that could be used in a psych evaluation, for instance, in the military to identify potential uh, perpetrators so they can be at least, I know it's politically incorrect, but singled out for right. really advanced training in uh, right. you know, situations. That is a great question, and I actually have a great answer for that. So, the Air Force does a psychological pro profile on their airmen when they enter the Air Force, right? We're looking for those kind of criteria, right? They have the highest percentage of sexual assault currently of the military community. And they try to identify these guys. And when I did the presentation uh, in Arizona, 
the leadership said that. They said, but we, we look for these guys. We test for this. How are they slipping through? They're smart. So when these young men on the college campus were surveyed, though, they didn't know that they were being tested for that, right? They were being asked questions like, okay, you're going to get a free pizza. Tell us about this. You know, their, their questions are more disguised. Versus, I think, probably the military and the, how their questions are crafted probably aren't as clever. They would probably say, what do you think about sexual assault? You know, instead of coming up with a clever way to ask the question. It's kind of like how they do their investigations. Why do they call the guy in? Did you rape her? There you go. There's a way to catch the guy, you know. Well, no, of course I didn't. You know, so my, I think that, that there's a lot more work that could be done in that area. But I think it has, to, it has to do with, one, coming up with better questions, you know. And you really need masters of that to do that. You really need to bring in a, you know, your greatest mind on questions, on how to draft questions. To, uh, to be able to do that in And then you have to be able to do it in a way where they don't know that that's what they're being tested for. I hope that answers the question for you. And the Air Force percentage rate was like 33%. It was very high. No one was being. I think that was the 2009 report. This is a really interesting question. I might want to open this up to some of the uh, uh, mental health care providers in the room. Did you say something about the ethical responsibility of counselors who suspect their client might be a perpetrator when that isn't a focus of therapy? Mm, wow. You know, I'm kind of a smoking gun person. If you come in and you tell me you committed a crime, I feel like I'm obligated to report it. I don't care what my line of work is. The problem is, is that when somebody comes into counseling, you don't know how mentally stable they are. You don't know if they're fabricating what they're telling you because they're not stuck in their head. So I think it becomes difficult. I think you have to maintain your client uh, confidentiality, kind of like being really a kid, you know, that confidentiality kind of thing. But, um, but I think, too, that um, I think it's probably your thing. I can't confirm or deny what I'm going to say, but I would probably say. I wouldn't continue doing these kinds of things because you could get in trouble, you know. But I think if I knew somebody clearly committed a crime, maybe I think there should be some kind of undisclosed way of you reporting that, that you believe somebody has committed a crime and that they need to be held accountable. So, again, I, I'm not an expert on the mental stability part. I don't know if they're fabricating or not. Yes, ma'am. If I could get the microphone on. Mental health professionals are mandated reporters. So um, your client knows it, it, in their um, in the initial consultation or meeting with them that you don't explain that to them. You are a mandated reporter. So if they tell you that they you know, that they have intentions to hurt somebody or assault somebody or that they have, you are mandated by law to report that. I feel better now. And if it begins to really sure about that, then I feel much better. And if it comes, starts to come out, or you're getting hints about it, you know, you you have to let the client know that you have concerns. I mean, I think generally you, you're you're upfront about that with the client. I'm beginning to get concerned. I'm hearing this. I'm hearing that. You know, so we go over that. And and at some point, you have to remind the client that you're a mandated reporter. And sometimes a lot of therapists will sit down. And make the call with the client right there in the room. So, well, thank you. I appreciate that. I wasn't really certain, but I always feel like I would be compelled to report. Good question. Do you have any information or feeling whether this is a major pro bigger problem in the United States versus England or some other? so-called civilized uh, Um, I would probably generalize the information because a lot of it is very statistical, right? So I would say that because it is statistical information that you could generalize it to other similar communities. So 
Another can be like, let's say, England, where their structure is much like we are, their justice system is much like ours is, so their numbers would probably be similar. I would have to probably see Google Scholar and go and see what kind of numbers they report. But I have never been in a situation where somebody from another country comes in and says that their numbers are much lower. They're generally usually pretty average. I would suggest, though, third world countries where the justice system isn't as probably good as ours, so ours isn't as great, but it's still probably better than some, that the numbers are probably much higher, like uh, uh, in underdeveloped countries, that the atrocities that occur uh, where women are mangled, physically mangled, and things like that, and there's no resources, no justice system to them to even go to. So I would say that they're probably higher in underdeveloped countries, but that in countries similar to ours, where there is a judicial system, that their economy is much like ours, it's going to be probably about the same. It would be. That would be a, a, a very good discipline to have. The culture we live in is very sexist, very gender based, and women are not valued in this society as much as they perhaps are in another society. And that's what leads to my question. Because you see in the media, the advertisements, in the publications, the periodicals, the general banter on campus is that women are therefore the same. So this sort of goes into the uh, meaning of women and the lack of equality in the campus that young men or older men perceive. And therefore, they have an entitlement. What do you think so on this? See, I would I agree that media and uh, social myths, what I call the social myths out there, influence a great degree that happens on a college campus. Uh, and how leadership responds, uh, the community uh, understanding or their feelings about that is influenced by. But I think if you take Berkowitz and take his approach, the social norms approach, and you publicize more what the norms are, that 90% of our men suggest we should treat our women with respect. 89% of our men uh, would not allow anything to happen to their sister. You know, things like that where you're reinforcing the values where it's not like, well, I don't know what's right or wrong. Um, we've made tremendous strides in preventing drunk driving and things like that. So look at the approach that we take. Berkowitz uh, approaches use uh, to, to great ends. You know, the, the media on TV, you'll be driven, here's what's going to happen. There's going to be effect points. So when it comes to our understanding of treating women with respect, then we need to publicize that more clearly. You know, uh, we don't talk badly about the women in our lives. Ninety percent of the men in our lives do. That way, now when they hear it, they're like, "Why would you say that?" They feel more comfortable addressing it because they realize that they're not that there's the norm, that they can stand up with themselves. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Okay. I was curious, do we have any research to suggest if this is a generational problem, meaning um, our children of what's more likely to continue being? Generational, like is it passed on from passed on. father to son to father to daughter? I would probably, and again, I'm speculating because I don't know the research in that area, but my, my guess would be is that there would be a high propensity for that. And the reason is is because we do know that in the military setting, that in settings where sexual harassment is pervasive, that the number of sexual assaults goes up. So if you're in a family setting where the treatment or mistreatment of women is, is allowed, then I think generationally it, it could carry on as well. Yes, I think so. It could be generated as far as the publication of that piece of paper. Yeah, I think so. One benefit of having an international student base and uh, attendance here, we have some uh, 
some reaction from international lawyers. Um, one offers that uh, prosecution is much more likely in the U.S. than um, in, uh, in France. And then a South African student here says the, uh, the, the instances of abuse or, or violence are far, far higher there. And the culture does uh, very, very little to uh, it's very little about it. I know that. Question well, thank back. you for providing those insights. That's, that's very helpful. There was a there was a documentary on HBO, and I regret that I did not get the name of it, but I just happened across the news about some of the atrocities in Africa that had taken place, and it was so graphic that I couldn't even watch the whole documentary. And so I appreciate you providing that information. It kind of lets us know that we still have a lot to work a lot of work to do here, but internationally as well. And again, that difference that you can make can be here, and it can also be in your travels when you go out and do speaking events um, in other countries. You can have an impact. Um, my question kind of dovetails off Dr. Heck's question in terms of is it possible through our um, over sexualization um, in advertising and television and the media that we're desensitizing society, therefore we're seeing, that's why maybe some are more reluctant to report cases, because maybe they're not as clear of their society's become more desensitized, that's why we're not seeing the uproar that we should see from the type of actions that are taking place. Well, I think that your question, you know, does the media influence how victims respond or even how the community at large views these cases, I think is, is right on. I think we need to challenge our film industry to do a better job of not, uh, you know, over-sexing women and things like that and those that are not. I don't even watch TV anymore because it just annoys me. You know, even the advertising annoys me. A great kid, but I, I don't, I've only had it in, in my room. I just uh, occasionally will watch a movie or something like that. I have Netflix and I think I've watched three movies in two years or something like that. But I don't watch a lot of movies. But I think we need to challenge our, uh, our industry from focusing on how great the product is and not how pretty the girl is standing next to the product. I think in your experience is the, uh, the internet and all the, uh, the social media uh, platforms, are those giving the better or potential perpetrators of different tools to uh, accomplish their crimes? Absolutely. And I'm sure the there are untold crimes that are taking place as a result of Facebook and uh, those uh, Twitter uh, that we're just not even aware of. Uh, just the, the phones themselves. I mean, a lot of times now you go to gyms and they tell you you can't take your phone into the locker room because uh, people were taking their phones into the locker room, taking pictures of other people and posting them on Facebook. So uh, uh, you have young kids out there. I mean, uh, all of us are touched in some way by this. I have a, uh, uh, a niece who... 14 years old, who took a picture of herself in her underwear and sent it to her boyfriend. Uh, uh, hello? Stop on the back of the head. What were you thinking? You know, but they're just, you know, it's the accessibility to technology, the ability to do different things with the technology. I think it's a big concern. And I think it, it allows these uh, maybe less social perpetrators to become more dangerous. Uh, we had a follow-up question that came in uh, related to what I asked. Uh, a listener works with victims of domestic violence uh, and witness, and they've witnessed how children see the violence and think that it's okay. How do you deal with the children? How do you deal with the children? Children and victims. Well, first of all, you have to understand that victims that are out there. A, only a small percentage, I think, really develop the skills that they need to be truly working on. Uh, many of them, I think, live in the dark for such a long time. And so then, if they're not doing well with their own trauma, how do their kids deal with the effects of that trauma? Um, I think it becomes important that we have the kids 
have a great passion and you equip them with the skills to understand the bad things that happen out there. And that uh, it becomes a lifelong journey then to continuously try to be the best person that you can be. So my personal experience with Rose is that I never have a Rose for a year as a head again. Uh, I don't know uh, when something might set me off and then I just want to completely devour some poor guy and head to go because he said something just the wrong way that, that triggers it. So, um, I think the more we can teach the young kids about PTSD, the more we can introduce them to uh, their family members and then understand how those who can affect them in their life. And I think it becomes important that we focus on equipping them with skills and finding out what works best for those individuals who have families. An interesting follow up uh, comment really on the uh, reporting. We are mandated to report potential risk that is specific and otherwise not. However, this could be a good opportunity to educate your clients to provide an opportunity to resolve their own issues around past crimes. I have worked with perpetrators of sexual abuse and murderers. They have souls to and may want to have the work on themselves. I worked with parents who have done terrible things in the line of combat. And this needs to be addressed too. We shouldn't be so quick to dismiss the humanity of some perpetrators. Another uh, question I think this is really getting to the efficacy of bystander training. Wondering if uh, men, due to their macho nature, might be more likely to jump to the defense of other men in sex and abuse and There's work that's been done in that area. And I would challenge them to go look at the work that's been done by cats. And he's actually one of the Los Angeles, he's a great speaker, also, but a great speaker. He's done a number of events at USC and we talk about that. And what he would suggest is that when men are given the facts, they will make the right choice. It's when they're making decisions and they don't have the right facts. So I would suggest that if I were to talk to you guys about somebody who treated me poorly, that you would not jump to their defense. That you would say, wow, oh, I might need to talk to these guys about it. That's, that would be my, my guess. Okay. Um, how do you see bystander training being implemented in the communities? Next slide. Okay. Yes, how do you see bystander training being implemented in schools mostly? Bystander training is really starting to take off now in the last couple of years. Uh, one of, a prime example is that at the USC campus, we have a program called Men Care, which is a, a bystander program. So we actually get juniors and seniors uh, to go out and do training uh, to the different groups on the college campus, and it's been very, very effective. And yeah, interesting enough, most recently in the last year, in some of the grants that are being uh, given out by the by the uh, government uh, includes components of bystander training. So uh, I think there's going to be more of that in the future. But, and they're also going to look for collaboration between groups. So it's going to be school, law enforcement, and a uh, support center. So they're, the grants are including as you have that, that those three components represent. You have law enforcement represented, you have a support service represented. And then you have the community that you're Another question related to that military community. How uh, would you compare the historic versus current resources that are available to military leaders? And uh, what's your assessment of the sufficiency of these resources? Okay, so historically there were no resources available for the military. Currently they have what they call uh, Victim Assistance Coordinator. Every unit now in the military has to have a Victim Assistance Coordinator identified in their unit. Now, that doesn't mean that they know what they're doing or that they're effective, but they have to have somebody identified. They have to go to training and things like that. Um, the other thing that they have is at the installation level, they have an office for Victim Assistance that they can then go to as well that will help them navigate the challenges of reporting and looking for counseling and things like that. So there are a number of resources 
um, available on the work crate installations uh, that weren't available in the past. Where the work needs to be done, though, is how can we inform commanders about understanding, again, how perpetrators operate and identifying them so that they can better deal with them. Step for more questions if you don't mind. From, uh, from a learner in Jamaica. So, do, uh, do you find it to be a norm that uh, many of the perpetrators were themselves, were themselves victims? She uh, mentions that she had or has had two clients who were victims and now surprised to find they have perpetrators and wonder how they are in the same case. I'm not surprised that somebody who is a perpetrator of a crime um, would have been subjected to some kind of family abuse or abuse when uh, they were growing up. But I would also suggest that there are those that have had no domestic violence in their life that are just purely perpetrators. That they are what I call perpetrators. And uh, they have learned to get away with doing what they do and they hone their skills over time and then to come into the center. In our particular case, the the person who had assaulted me or assaulted somebody else in another location, but they said it wasn't relevant because we were different groups. And I said, we do think it shows a pattern. You know, so there's there's more there's more that you can do. Asks, uh, other evaluating school based programs for adolescents. And then get back Oh, absolutely. I, uh, in the last year, have done more speaking events in high school than I have in the last three years combined. And um, and what you'll find is that young people truly do want to know how to navigate some of these social uh, conditions or situations that they find themselves in. And what you'll find is that the young men out there want to be good young men, but they may not necessarily be equipped on how to handle situations. An example would be, let's say you're at a basketball game, and there are three girls, three guys sitting together. Maybe the guys are sitting together, and the girls are sitting together in a row. And maybe somebody comes and sits next to one of the girls, and it makes them look a little uncomfortable. And it's clear to the guy, to the young man, that this guy is much older, and maybe he puts a hand on the young girl's knee, which in my opinion would be inappropriate. So, what can they do? Well, we would tell them in a situation like that, if you don't have to confront the guy and say, look, you know, you need to get lost, beat a guy, something like that. But what you could do is say, hey, ladies, we want to talk to you about what we're going to do after the game. Why don't you come sit over here? And then you switch places. So, you're able to diffuse a potential situation that's uncomfortable and at the same time let that person get the message that you're not welcome without creating the scene. So in our schools, we have great potential to train our young people on how to deal with these kinds of situations using uh, bystander training. Absolutely. Questions are still coming here. Uh, this is a uh, really interesting question. Do you feel that, feel that religion plays a role in In perpetrating the crime or in, in looking for support? I'm not clear. I don't think. Perpetrating the crime. Wow. Well, I, I have never personally seen religion used as a forum or a platform for which you could perpetrate a crime, but. I would also just suggest that that 7.6% is represented in that group as well, that they are not immune to being predators. Not at all. I would say that just like you're going to find them in athletes, you're going to find them in clergy as well. You're going to find them in architects. You're going to find them in nursing. You're going to find them in all walks of life. So no, they are not immune. They could very well be a predator as well. In order to learn who submitted that question, I think that uh, you could clarify the question if you didn't address it. Okay. Uh, I'll put the second to last question. What about the, the stigmatization of the victim in the world? Are victims being uh, more encouraged to report a rape today, or are they still encouraged to uh, report a rape? In the military. Yes. 
Okay, so as we know, the military was a war machine. And it's a very hyper masculine war machine. And it's a very male dominated war machine. And so I would suggest that the difficulties in reporting are probably just as great, if not greater. And I say that those difficulties are greater now for reporting because we are actively engaged in war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And the mission comes first. And many times, uh, other things that are happening become less important. And sometimes, instances of sexual assault seem less important. They don't come to the surface in ways that they, that they should. So I would say that they probably need to step it up more if they really want to make a difference. So for the women in the military, what could, what could they do? Continue to report. And all we can do is encourage and the fact that they have this um, this uh, ability to report without disclosing themselves, they can say that a crime has occurred, occurred in a unit and uh, and that would bring investigators in and maybe look at the crime and see what's going on and talk to leadership and, and do an assessment of what's happening. I guess this is a good question to uh, to wrap up. What's your level of optimism for real positive change in both the civilian and military communities? Well, I am very positive about the potential for change. And again, the reason I say that is because one, there's more there's more people out there talking about it now in our communities and things like that. And I can make the change as we can because we've done it in the past. We've done it with teenage pregnancy. There was a time when it was like, you know, there were so many young teenagers that were pregnant. It was crazy. So what did we do? We did this whole campaign for years. I mean, I think every day I went to school, there was something about teenage pregnancy that we were being beat about the head and shoulders about it, or being informed about it, or here's what you can do to prevent it, or here, you know, here are your options, you know, things like that. And we made a difference. Teenage pregnancy dropped tremendously. So when we pick something, and we really want to tackle it, we can make a difference. We did it with our driving. You know, we improved the laws, we improved how they handle, you know, law enforcement's response to it. So the potential is there. We just need our great minds to come together and come up with the right tools to use in those different settings and different practices. Yeah.